Hello, I am Bülent Tabalı. I'm going to present you the paper titled Data Compression Accelerator on IBM Power9 and Z15 processors. We implemented a data compression accelerator called NXU on the Z15 and Power9 processor chips. On the left is Z15, on the right is Power9. These pictures are not drawn to scale. At the bottom is NXU zoomed in. Uh, we will talk about this in detail later. First, let's talk about uh, compression. Why we need compression? Because it makes the data smaller and, and it can save storage and memory capacity and it can increase the encryption and data transmission bandwidth such as IO and networking. Why compression has not been used pervasively? Because it is a CPU intensive op operation and therefore it's used in specialized applications but we would like to change that with introduction of NXU. NXU on Z15 and Power9 nearly eliminates all CPU cycles spent on compression. NXU achieves orders of magnitude speed up over a single core for the deflate algorithm. It achieves more than 10 times uh, speed up over an entire chip full of cores on a fully configured Z15, NXU gets 280 gigabytes per second total throughput. You can compare that to a PCIe card, which may possibly get 4 gigabytes per second. Savings potential in a large enterprise will be in the millions of dollars per year in storage, memory, and data transmission costs. So to prove that point, I retrieved AWS prices from the web. Um, I used AWS because the prices were available. If you were to rent a petabyte of storage on AWS, you will pay nearly 290,000 per year. If the data were to compress by a factor of four, 290K would drop down to 75K. A single memory server running Memcached or Redis would cost you 70,000 per year. But if the data were to compress by a factor of two, the, the price would drop down to 35K. Not only you save in storage and memory, but you may also get application speed up. We have an experimental result that shows that uh, 23% speed up for Spark TPCDS uh, benchmark is possible. So IBM has employed compression hardware and software extensively in its products. These are some of the examples. When we started this project, we had three primary goals. The accelerator had to be area efficient because it has to coexist with the cores on the processor chip. It had to be high throughput and the compression ratio had to be better than the prior hardware methods. So the features and the novelties listed here helped achieve those goals. And I will talk about these in detail uh, next. NXU uses the deflate method. Deflate is LZ77 followed by the Huffman algorithm. In Deflate's LZ77 method, the most recent 32 kilobyte of raw data is used as a compression dictionary. Duplicate strings in the dictionary are replaced by copy instructions. In this example, the phrase there is replaced by copy five bytes from 200 bytes ago. Next, Huffman encoding is applied. Frequent symbols are encoded with fewer bits in Huffman encoding. Letter E, the most frequent in English, is encoded with 6 bits, whereas R with 9 bits in this example. Some of the challenges of designing a high throughput accelerator like this are finding the longest matching string in this 32 kilobyte sliding window, producing a code table on the fly, Decoding these variable length codes 
at a rate greater than one code per cycle. NXG occupies less than half a percent of the entire chip area. It produces or consumes eight bytes per cycle of raw data at a frequency of two to two and a half gigahertz. On Z15 and Power9, compression cores are nearly identical, but Z15 was done later, so it has doubled the number of hash table ports for performance reasons and it produces the code tables in hardware. Both have user mode access with low latency. User buffers are virtually address, no page pinning or system calls are necessary. This is a high level block diagram of NXU. The, here's a decompressed macro right here. There's a compressed macro over here. There is a history FIFO implementing the sliding window. And there's a hash table for finding strings in this history FIFO. DMA engine interfacing to the uh, processor fabric on the chip. And some, some address translation support, Nest MMU, and an ERAT on Power9. ERAT is basically a TLB-like structure. Let's talk about one of the novelties of NXU. Traditionally, two methods have been used for searching strings in hardware. First method is using a CAM. The second method is basically using hash tables. CAMs are precise, but they are airy and power hungry. You cannot build a very large CAM. Hash tables, on the other hand, uh, they are area efficient, but they are imprecise and lossy. We estimate that our hash table stores uh, 14 to 16 times as many bits than a CAM per unit area. Now, we recognize from prior work that compression ratio levels off with increasing window sizes. In this example, you see that Increasing the window size, which is uh, affects SRAM, SRAM capacity, increasing the window size from 16K to 32K doesn't change the compression ratio much. So we decided why not use the area efficient hash table in this region and use CAM in this region where the compression ratio matters the most. So we split the design accordingly. There's a near history cam and there's a far history cam. And from this picture, you can see their relative sizes by area. So this is the hash table uh, region, the green, and the cam in the blue. Our cam is based on a design found in an old IBM tape product. Input is latched eight bytes per cycle here. Um, Old input is shifted into uh, 512 byte latches here, implementing the sliding window. And there are 4096 comparators comparing every input byte to the every history byte. Um, strings are identified, and a priority encoder uh, identifies the longest uh, matching string among all of them. This design also handles uh, strings, uh, string matches longer than eight bytes. Um, if a match ends uh, at a cycle boundary, it will be indicated in these continuation registers. And if the match continues into the next cycle, it will be tracked and up to 258 uh, byte strings can be matched uh, through this design. Our history logic is basically a hash table operating like an eight-way set associative cache with eight read and write ports. The input phrase is tokenized, um, five byte turned out to be optimal. Five, eight overlapping five byte tokens are hashed into hash table locations. Here, the token there is hashed into an hash table row. In that row are eight addresses. These are the addresses 
that this token might have been seen before. Since there are eight tokens, the hash table returns 64 history FIFO addresses where this phrase may be found. Those are filtered down to two because the history FIFO has two ports. And the history FIFO contents are compared to the input to find the longest matching string. Huffman encoder encodes LZ references with 1 to 15 bit variable length Huffman codes. Towards that, the Huffman encoder uses an LZ stats module which counts the frequencies of the LZ77 symbols. DHD gen to produce a code table, and finally a Huffman encoder that encodes the symbols with that code table. Uh, to, to collect the statistics, we actually have to do two passes over the data. First pass collects the symbol frequencies. Once the code table is done, a second pass is done to actually encode the data and output coded streams. Since two pass uh, would reduce the uh, throughput, we use a method called 1.1 pass, uh, where we sample only the first 32 kilobytes of data as a representative of the rest of the string. Uh, decompression is interesting. Uh, decoding variable length codes is inherently sequential. Uh, you cannot decode the next code until the current one is decoded, decoded because you don't know where the next code starts. And these are variable length uh, codes. In one extreme, in one 32-bit input word, you can have 32 one-bit codes. In the other extreme, you may have two 15-bit codes in the same 32-bit input. So how do we achieve eight codes per cycle, which is our objective? So we implemented a speculative decoder. Um, in speculative decoding, there are 32 um, uh, parallel decoders. Each one assumes that the code starts at uh, bit offset 0, 1, and through 31. And they all go at it in parallel. Um, trying to find the length of the uh, of their respective code and later in the pipeline uh, the invalid decodes are dismissed and finally the starting bit of the first code is determined and once the starting bit is determined you hand off the entire word to a full decoder and there are eight of those and they all they can all go in parallel and produces the four LZ references as shown. Here's another interesting feature. On Power9 Linux, uh, we wanted to have a very low latency and we wanted to minimize any kernel interaction. So a user mode uh, page fault handling library was implemented. Um, the reason for that is we didn't want to teach Linux how to handle uh, compression faults either. The way it works is the library touches the user source and target buffers ahead of time to make them present in memory and submits the job to NXU. If for any reason, for low memory conditions, etc., a page is missing, NXU will complain. It will write a status back to the status block that the page is missing. The user library will retry the job, potentially with fewer pages to minimize the chances of page faults. Um, we benchmarked um, three different data sets for compression ratio. At the end of uh, uh, three groups, each of the three groups, are the averages for all algorithms. NXU does little worse than GZIP and Z standard. Um, with much focus on area and throughput, we gave up some on compression ratio. 
And another uh, observation is that um, uh, one point one pass and two pass methods slightly differ one to two percent on average, except for these uh, outliers marked in yellow. Turns out these two files, uh, the front and the back of the files are very different, so the 1.1 pass sampling method doesn't work well. Another interesting observation is uh, Z standard doing better than GZIP uh, in these uh, two cases. Uh, Z standard is a more recent uh, 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 software. It uses a a uh, large window larger than 32 kilobyte and it also uses a uh, entropy coder uh, called ans better than huffman uh, algorithm so uh, we think that that's the reason for these differences this is the compression throughput on power 9 compress nxu compress is 388 times faster than Zlib running on a single core. On Z15, 574 times faster than a single core. This is a spectacular result. So on P9 and Z15, for large data, uh, uh, Z15 is twice as fast. And this is because of the double the number of hash table ports. For decompression, speed up ratios are uh, less than compression ratios. On P9, NXU is 34 times faster than a core. On Z15, 30 times faster than a core. Decompression is basically a table lookup followed by memory to memory copy. As a result, it is faster, uh, relatively faster than compression. For example, with 80 threads, 80 SMT4 threads on P9. In aggregate, uh, we get uh, higher decompression throughput than a single NXU. Now some results on accelerator latency. Uh, there's a setup time to get the accelerator going. First, software has to prepare the command, uh, submit the command, and the hardware has to do some initialization. We model that with this equation. T0 is the setup time, which is the data size independent portion of the execution time. So this setup time, uh, smaller is better, is responsible for this sloping curve here, um, uh, which basically says that uh, higher the setup time, uh, the less efficient accelerator is with smaller data. So we measured the setup times uh, T0 on P9 and Z15. Z15. For compress, uh, they are 2.2 and 5.2 microseconds. Uh, P9 and Z15 use different uh, libraries, therefore these are different. For decompress, they are 2.9 and 1.9 microseconds. Uh, the actual hardware latencies are actually less than uh, one microsecond each. Now some results on um, NXU power and energy efficiency. We measured the throughput of the NXU over here and software on cores over here. While we were measuring the throughput, we also measured the power of the server, the delta power of the server. You can see from the solid green bars that when NXU is operating, independent of the number of threads, uh, the, the power is in the 28 to 42 um, uh, uh, watt range. Whereas with Zilib on cores in the 80 thread case, uh, power is as high as 183 watts. So we divide the power with the throughput. As a result, we get the energy per gigabyte, uh, the unit of work, basically. So we see that the accelerator-based energy is in the order of 5 joules per gigabyte, whereas for uh, software compression on cores, we get as high as 986 joules uh, per gigabyte. So that's like a factor of 
200. Um, now this is not a uh, this is a server uh, energy is not that important but if it was a mobile platform uh, having an accelerator would have made a uh, big difference in terms of uh, battery life and uh, efficiency here's the result on end-to-end -end application performance uh, Spark is a distributed computing platform. TPCDS is a decision support benchmark. It uh, models a data warehouse. Uh, large amounts of data are stored in the Hadoop file system in compressed uh, columnar file format. Data is decompressed while reading them into the nodes and nodes exchange data among themselves and uh, data is compressed and uncompressed to reduce the volume of data so spark uh, tpcds heavily relies on data compression the baseline uh, spark uses snappy and lz4 snappy for the file and lz4 for the shuffle step so we replaced snappy and lz4 with power 9 nxu and we achieved 23% um, speed up uh, in uh, queries per hour. In conclusion, we demonstrated uh, novel on chip compression accelerators for Power9 and Z15, the, which overcome the shortcomings of uh, existing approaches. And we advanced the state of the art in hardware based compression in terms of area throughput and latency. Our potential future directions may be um, configurable programmable accelerators and instruction sets, and improved compression ratio and throughput, and perhaps uh, embedding compression in processor caches, memory, and IO links. Thank you for listening to my presentation.